Hi everybody. I am Moss. Moss Chercogel, the regular host for these virtual Institute tastings. And I am steaming hot out here. I live on Vancouver Island. It's supposed to be raining all the time. It's supposed to be cold. It's supposed to be drizzly. It's supposed to be cloudy. Usually I go through the effort to try to maneuver the camera so that you don't have any glare from the window. But today, I thought it was important that you see the glare from the window because you need to remember how incredibly hot it is out there. Look at that. It's just pure white. It's just, it's just the searing light of a harsh and unforgiving sun. But there is always hope, right? After every heat dome comes and frazzles us to the end of our nerves, causes us to wear sunglasses inside, there is always a light at the end of the tunnel, a figurative light. The literal light is, uh, in fact, horrific and blistering. Uh, but the figurative light at the end of the tunnel uh, tonight comes in the form of wine, of ice-cold, crisp, refreshing wine. We planned this tasting months in advance. We thought, okay, you know, June 29th, this will be a good time to talk about fresh, clean, uh, revitalizing white wines. And, uh, and boy, oh boy, was that prophetic. Did we ever uh, hit that one on the head, planning that out for today? So I've got these four icy cold bottles. Oh, that's lovely. Mm. I'm going to be doing a lot of that this evening. Because, of course, I can't have a fan on because it would create uh, noise pollution and you would hear the buzz. So I'm just full baking it here, right? I'm just in a room, literally next to a fireplace, not active, I should point out, but uh, relying entirely on these wines to cool me down and nothing else. So tonight, as we've already expressed, the topic is going to be refreshing white wines. But that seems like it's casting a pretty broad net don't you think? Uh, refreshing white wines. What makes a white wine refreshing? Surely everybody who is watching this has tried white wine before, I would, I would hope, I would assume. Otherwise, I have no idea why you blundered into this. But well, maybe this is a good time to learn. Uh, but maybe you've noticed that there are certain wines that are cleaner, zestier, fresher tasting, and there are some that are a little bit uh, heftier, a little bit denser, and don't quite, um, don't quite give you the vigor and the energy that you get from some of these leaner, lighter, crisper wines. So what is it that makes a wine fresh or crisp or clean? I'm just putting down my branded Oliver Soyuz Wine Country sunglasses. Just have to point out that I am wearing the branded wear. Um, what makes a wine fresh and clean and crisp? And the answer is, is, is pretty easy and it's acid it is acid a lot of people shy away from the idea of acidity in foods or wines because you know it has this association with upsetting your tummy creating things like acid reflux uh, you know you get this kind of this 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 bilious searing notion in your mind when you think about the word acid acid but in fact, acid is what brings beauty and life to most foods and wines that you enjoy. And there is an interesting relationship between acid and sweetness and alcohol and another factor that I'm going to talk really briefly about here, which is um, pH. pH is uh, a, a, a little um, notation that you sometimes see on the technical sheets that appear to go along with wine. You'll see, uh, you'll see a wine listed that has its RS, which stands for... Do we know what RS stands for? I can't hear you. Uh, it stands for residual sugar. And we use the term residual sugar to really clarify the fact that we're not adding sugar to wines. Uh, that, uh, that generally speaking, the sugar that is in there is there from the grape. When we ferment away the sugar, oftentimes a little tiny bit gets left at the end that doesn't get converted into alcohol, and so RS is the term for residual sugar, how much sugar is in there. 
Next, we have the term TA. TA stands for total acidity. There are multiple different types of acid that exist within wine. There are things like malic acid, uh, which is sort of your, your fruit, your berry acid. There's lactic acid, which can come if you do a special process to create this softer, creamier type of acid. And there is um, a different type of acid that I can't remember right now. I wasn't really planning to, to describe these, but um, what is it? Oh, that's gonna drive me nuts. I'll remember it in two minutes. So anyways, there's different types of acid that are in play, and so we lump them together into a term called total acid. So when you say TA, that is the ranking of how acidic the wine is. But it doesn't necessarily tell you the whole story, because a wine that has a high level of TA, a high level of total acidity, you would assume is going to taste tart and acidic. However, there's this other factor, pH, and pH is just as important as TA, because your acidity does not just come straight through onto your palate, uh, you know, unblocked. No, no, it's, it's actually held back and resisted by pH. So pH is this really fascinating component of wine. High pH levels will, in fact, block the sensation of acidity. So the acidity is there, but you might not taste it as much. However, very low levels of pH will allow whatever acid is there to get you, to really express itself. And so that means that you can look at the acid levels, but you also have to look at the pH levels to see how much zing it's going to have. And like I said at the beginning of this, when I, before I started talking about numbers and, and abbreviations, I, uh, I said that acid is what makes these things taste fresh and bright and lively. It can be balanced against sweetness, certainly. Everybody has probably experienced, um, you know, making lemonade. You make lemonade uh, with, with your pure lemons to start off if you're making it from scratch, and you taste it, and it is sour. It is extremely sour because the acid levels are through the roof. The pH is very low in lemons, and so you're getting this intense, unobstructed spear of acidity to your tongue. So then you stir in your sugar, and that is going to bring up the, the basically this, this buffer that protects you from the acid. The acid is still there, but you don't taste it as much because of the sweetness. So you can block acid using sweetness. However, not everybody wants to make an incredibly sweet wine to temper their levels of acid. And so that's where pH can allow you to have something bright and energetic and fresh that doesn't come across as biting. By the way, since I'm talking about sugar and, uh, and uh, lemons, really quick iced tea tip. If you're making iced tea, you want to, of course, boil your water, you want to make your tea, and then you want to stir in the sugar right away while the water is still hot so that it dissolves properly, but then you do not add the lemon. You want to wait until it cools down entirely, then you add your lemon, because if you add your lemon when it's still hot, it makes the, uh, the iced tea cloudy. Still tastes just as good, but it makes it cloudy. So if you want clean looking, refreshing iced tea that looks just as good in the glass as it tastes on the tongue, wait until the very end until it's cold to stir in your lemon. There you go. That was Moss's iced tea tip. Got that from my sister. And uh, let's move on to actually tasting some wine, shall we? We've got four uh, absolutely brilliant wines right here. These are exactly what I wanted on a hot day like this. And we have actually divided them um, up so that Conveniently, we're getting wines from, from two different spots in the Okanagan Valley. We have uh, a little patch just on the edge of the Golden Mile, which is the west-hand side of the Okanagan Valley when you're going between Oliver and Asoyus. You've got the, uh, the Golden Mile tucked right there in the west, and, uh, and there is Road 8. Road 8 is a very good road. I highly recommend going onto Road 8 and trying wine from every winery that you find there. Buy cases and cases of wine from any winery that you happen to stumble across on Road 8. It is an extremely good road. Up at the top of Road 8, there is a T-junction. On the left-hand side, Hester Creek. On the right-hand side, Geringer Brothers. Two uh, incredibly important wineries to the local area that also have tapped into the history of Oliver and Soyuz grape growing, and in fact, British Columbia grape growing. Hester Creek boasts 52-year-old vines, and the Geringer brothers were some of the original founding fathers 
of of the uh, the local wine industry, I- including being some of the founding members of the uh, the, the BC VQA uh, system that came in in 1990. So you have Hester Creek and you have Geringer Brothers right side by side, both of these sort of legendary legacy figures, and both making absolutely brilliant wines that I have right smack dab in the center right here. And then if we go over to the east side of the valley, we go to the Black Sage Bench. And there on the Black Sage Bench, you have this, uh, this, this, this little curve of road uh, if you come off of Road 9, which is right across from Road 8. So, you know, you start on Road 8. As I said, buy cases and cases of wine from any winery that you happen to find on Road 8. And then cross the highway onto Road 9. You go over a little bridge, you start to bend, and you see a winery. And if you travel a little bit past it, you see another winery. And those two wineries are Nostalgia and Silver Sage. And so I have wine from Nostalgia and Silver Sage. And some people may be saying, Nostalgia, I have never seen the winery Nostalgia for. I have never heard of it. Well, you have, but you've known it by a different name. Nostalgia was known as Oliver Twist until just recently, just just within uh, a couple of months. A month, month and a half, something like about five or six weeks, let's say. Uh, nostalgia is the uh, is the sort of successor to Oliver Twist. Same wines, same winemaker, same owner, just a change in the name. But we'll talk about that when we uh, when we get to it. So, what we're going to start with here uh, in in our nice little uh, pair of, of of coupled wineries, immediate neighbors to each other. We're going to start off over on the west hand side. West hand is a term uh, with a little bit of Silver Sage, because ah, it is ooh, the winery that has brought us a sparkling wine today. And again, like I said, I'm going to probably rub these all over my face a few times. Just, uh, just bear with me. I apologize. Silver Sage is really one of the most charming wineries in Oliver Soyuz, in, in British Columbia, I would say. I have known many people in the wine industry, and, uh, and I have known many people who are interested in touring around BC and learning about BC wine. And everybody that I know in the Okanagan who fields guests, if you have people coming in from out of town, and they want a little tour, they say, choose some wineries for me. You know about wineries, Moss, or Teresa, or Stuart, or Raylene, or whoever, right? You know about wineries. Where should we go? Take us to see some wineries. A winery that consistently comes up on that list is always Silver Sage. It is always Silver Sage, and it's because going to Silver Sage is just so incredibly fun. The people that work at Silver Sage have such a uh, dynamic showmanship they have such a, 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 a almost like a like a, a carnival style uh, a, a showmanship where they create this uh, this this snazzy jazzy story to go along with every wine. Sometimes it's a little racy, sometimes it's a little risque, and uh, and they just boom 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 boom. They just smack you in the face with wines, and it is something that nobody should miss. It is, uh, it is really incredible. The one caveat that I say is that I, I always say, go to Silver Sage, but save it for the last step of the trip because you're going to wind up tasting so many things at Silver Sage. They, they come at you hot with, uh, with, they've got, I think they have maybe 17 wines uh, in their lineup. And, uh, and you may not try necessarily every single one of them, but, uh, but, but you will try a lot of them. And a lot of them are so intensely flavorful that uh, that you're, you're, you're going to want to retire after that. You're going to want to buy a case of wine and you're going to want to go back to your hotel room after you are done with it. So we're actually going in reverse order of what I would typically recommend in terms of physical wine touring. I would usually say end off at Silver Sage, uh, but, uh, but today we are going to start off with them because, like I said, they have this lovely sparkling wine. I have talked about this process uh, in the past because I've been opening sparklings on almost all of these video tastings. But just a quick reminder for everybody that uh, that if you want to uh, safely and competently open a bottle of sparkling wine, you've got a couple of options. If you want to saber it, if you want to be dramatic, which I never want to do because I'm in my, I'm in my living room, 
And my wife has called me out for spilling quite a bit of sparkling wine on this carpet uh, below me from our previous virtual tastings. Um, but to savor, what you want to do is get the wine as cold as possible, put it in the freezer until it is absolutely frigid, and then take it out, undo the cage, move the cage up one notch, and then you want to reseal it above the higher lip. The cage is naturally attached uh, uh, under the lowest lip, and then there's a little lip just above it. So redo the cage up top. That's going to keep the uh, the cork from accidentally blowing off while you are attempting to do it, which is not such a bad thing, but it can be surprising. And then you would want to take off the, uh, the, the capsule, and you would want to find the seam. There's always a seam running vertically down the bottle. You find that seam, you take a, a, your your medieval saber or a butter knife uh, you actually want to use the flat blunt end you press it against the seam you rub it and then you smack you're not chopping never ever chop that's incredibly dangerous instead what you want to do is slide it forward you want to slide it forward so that you smack that bottom lip and then boom it'll pop right off beautiful easy that's how you saber a bottle of wine this is a good season to do it go outside into the sun and uh, create a big mess now if you want to open it a little more sedately, uh, which which I also understand is not a uh, an adjective that usually goes along with silver sage wines. But uh, but if you want to be a little bit more uh, conservative and calm about it, what you do is, first of all, you always face your label outwards so that your guests and audience can always see the name of the wine, which in this case is the silver sage sparkling velvet. And then you go ahead and you take a a, a napkin. I've got a paper towel, you take a uh, take a dishcloth or something like that, and just wrap that around the, uh, the, the cork so that you're holding the cork, and then just twist the bottle ever so slightly. And then you'll find that, oh, let me try to get the sound here, there we go, a little thump. It pops out quite easily, quite neatly, and there you have it inside your, uh, your napkin, right? Clean, tidy, it doesn't go blowing all over the place. My children, my three and six year old children were running around in our lawn uh, the other day and one of them said, what is this on the ground? And it was a sharp piece of metal that had been tamped down into the grass and had been there for a month since the last time that um, somebody's parents were in town. I'm not going to say whether it was mine or my, uh, my wife's, but uh, somebody was in town and opened a bottle of sparkling wine and apparently blew a piece of jagged metal into my lawn for my children to find later. So, take note. If you want to do it a little more cautiously, you use the cloth, you hold it in the hand, and just give it a nice little twist. I'm certainly not casting shade at any parents who may or may not be watching this live stream right now. So, the sparkling velvet. I haven't told you what it is yet, because, well, what it is, first and foremost, is fun. And I want, if anybody is tasting along, I want you to have a taste of it first. First of all, look at the, uh, look at the, the, the color is almost completely clear, right? We are dealing with white wines here. All of these wines are white. And because they are white, hmm. It means that they have not had any exposure to the wine skins. That is where all the coloration comes from. Some grapes like Pinot Gris uh, tend to have very um, uh, colorful skins, even though they're white wines, and that means that they can leach a little bit of color out even without you really intending to get much. But, uh, but these grapes all right here have fairly color fast skins, and so if you do not want them to have any coloration, they do not. So again, look at how incredibly clear that wine is it is like crystal and you have these nice big fat bubbles these big bead shaped bubbles that are trickling up there from the bottom Ooh. with um sparkling wine you know they, they they do say that if you want to preserve the mousse which is the foam on the top then you shouldn't swirl it around but i always swirl it around anyways because when you swirl any wine, whether it's sparkling or, or any other one, you're always going to get more aromatic quality. You're going to get a, a better smell. It's just going to give you more information. And that is, of course, what we are in town for. 
we want to learn from these wines. We want to enjoy them, we want to taste them, but we also want to try to pick out as much as we can from them so that we can tell our respective spouses that we were learning something tonight and not just getting drunk alone in front of a laptop. Okay, so right away, on the nose, you get big fruit. Big, big, big fruit. Ah. There's a little bit of a, um, a little bit of sort of a, sort of a, a syrupy, um, like canned fruit, like canned pear. And a little bit of a citrus tropical, you know, we, we, we use these broad categories when we are doing our wine evaluation. So you start with things like, smells like berries. And then you narrow it in and say, oh, well, is it red berries or is it dark berries? Okay, and if it's red berries, then maybe you can go closer and say, well, is it cranberries or is it raspberries? Or is it um, salmon berries if you're out here on the island? Um, and so we use these broad categories to kind of get us closer and closer. And the categories are a matter of convenience. And so right here, I'm smelling some citrus. I'm also smelling some tropical. And there are some places where citrus and tropical cross over. Tropical tends to refer to things like papaya, guava. Uh, sometimes melon will fit into that. Whereas citrus is, of course, your oranges, your limes, your lemons, your grapefruits. And so, certainly, I'm getting a bit of that grapefruit, but as well, pineapple. There's the pineapple, and that sits almost directly between citrus and tropical, because it has elements of both. It has the, the sort of rich sweetness that you tend to find in the tropical fruits. And it has that little bit of acidity that you find in the citrus. So let's go ahead and have a uh, have a taste here. <laughs> you have to be careful with that. I always do that little uh, that little suck in of air. I get it onto my tongue and then I suck in air, and that tends to kind of flare up the uh, the, the flavor and give you a little bit of enhancement. It's just like swirling it, <laughs> but when you're doing it with a sparkling wine. Sometimes when you suck in the air, you just conjure up like a tidal wave of bubbles that then just fires down the back of your throat. So again, it's good that you're all in your own home so that you can test this out without any of the rest of us being able to see you. Okay, so on the palate. It's bright, it's fruit forward. It is... It bears a little bit of acid, right, which makes it fresh, but it's got a little bit of sweetness in there too. Silver Sage does tend towards slightly sweeter wines, um, whether they are literally sweet in terms of their residual sugar or whether they simply uh, project as sweet. We'll talk about that a little bit more with some of these other wines, but sometimes you don't necessarily have a high sugar content. Instead, you just have the impressions of sweetness based on the type of fruit that you're tasting. And, uh, and that can tell you that it's sweet even when it isn't literally sweet. So if you know people or if you happen to be somebody who enjoys sweeter wines or things just even a little bit on the sweeter side, again, Silver Sage is a, a really fantastic choice, although I would recommend it for everybody even if you don't necessarily care for sweet wines. But this, uh, this, this track's a little bit sweet, but it has a little bit of that acid. And you have this marvelous blend of a little bit, um, something almost a little bit herbal. There's, a, there's, there's this little something that is just a touch herbaceous, a um, little tiny bit green that comes up against the, the really ripe fruit. And so it, it's, it, it's about time that I tell you what this wine is made of. It is a Gewürztraminer. Uh, Gewürztraminer is uh, is a horribly misnamed grape. Um, it is it is called Gewürztraminer, which means the spicy grape from Traminer. But of course, it is not spicy, nor is it actually from Traminer, because there's a different grape from Traminer that then became a descendant of Gewürztraminer. And in Germany, spicy means um, uh, floral. Uh, and so it actually means the floral grape that descended from a grape called Traminer. So it's very confusing, unnecessary uh, explanation as to why it has such a bizarre name. But Gewürztraminer is a very nice grape 
that has sort of lychee fruit and floral characteristics. It tends to track sweet, right? Even when it's not literally sweet, it tends to appear as sweet. But in this particular wine, the 2019 Gewürztraminer has been balanced with grapefruit juice, pineapple juice, and local apricot juice from, uh, from, from the Okanagan Valley. And so that means that we actually have a four juice cocktail here grapes pineapples grapefruit and apricots and it is very fun to try some of the wines from oliver or sorry oliver twist silver sage see the problem is that i was on that road i was on road nine or sage sagebrush um uh it is very fun to try the wines of silver sage uh with people who don't necessarily know what it is that is coming inside silver sage does a lot uh, uh so, sorry silver sage does a lot of wines that mix together grapes and other fruit and they do it to I, I gotta say pretty remarkable effect there are not a huge amount of fruit wineries in uh in british columbia uh, it, it's it's actually surprising you think that there would be more um, considering that there's a lot of places in BC where you can grow fruit, but you can't necessarily grow grapes all that effectively. Well, Silver Sage has the distinction of sitting within one of the primo locations, one of the best locations in BC to grow grapes, and yet they bring in different types of fruit to coordinate and enhance certain flavors. And so you can try... You can try, uh, uh, you know, a red wine that has fruit added to it. You can try a white wine that has fruit added to it. They have, I'm trying to think, it's a four, four white wines and four red wines. Uh, and then they have seven dessert wines. So, the, so they don't actually have 17 wines on their, uh, on their menu. They have 15 uh, wines on their menu. But, um, but seven uh, of those wines are dessert wines. And they make such an incredible variety of dessert wines um, that, like I said before, even if you don't necessarily usually tend towards sweeter wines, you'll probably find something that you'll enjoy. My personal favorite is their blueberry dessert wine, which is absolutely fantastic. It is so flavorful. It is so potent. Uh, and, uh, and if you mix it together with dark rum, you can call it a bluebeard. And it's a very, very good cocktail. Uh, the the pearl is another is another um, fan favorite another very well known uh, wine of theirs with this wonderful sort of uh, blackberry black currant uh, sort of a little bit a uh, little bit like port um, and uh, and of course the wine that they are probably the most famous for uh, that uh, that maybe if if you've only tried one wine from Silver Sage or you've only heard about one wine from Silver Sage you've probably heard of it is uh, is the uh, the flame which is a, uh, a dessert wine that has a spicy hot red pepper inside of the bottle. <laughs> and they sell two different versions of it. They sell a version that has the pepper still in, and it is hot. And then once you open the bottle and it starts to oxidize, well, what does oxygen do to piquant spicy heat? It, it inflames it. And so that means that as you, as you leave it, uh, it starts to get hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter. And because it's a dessert wine, it can keep a good long time, uh, even when it once open. So you can open this, this wine and then recork it and put it back in your fridge and just let it simmer and get hotter and hotter. But they also sell a version of the flame that had the pepper in it, but that has had the pepper removed so that it's not quite as intense. Um, again, I know firsthand that, uh, that they make fantastic Caesars. You can make such a good Caesar out of that, uh, out of that flame wine. Mm. So Silver Sage, um, founded in 1996 by a Romanian couple that came over. It was, uh, it was, uh, Anna and Victor. And, uh, and both of them actually had uh, a history, uh, a family history with viticulture. Both of them, um, their fathers, um, managed vineyards. And so both of them had this, uh, this, this kind of inspiration to, uh, to try to build something, um, in the wine world within British Columbia. And, mm. and so Silver Sage is, is sort of the culmination of that dream. And again, I cannot stress enough how 
you absolutely need to visit Silver Sage if you have not visited it before because it is such a wild and wonderful experience. They have a B and B uh, on site, and uh, and you know they've got multiple rooms. Uh, they 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 say they say it's a B and B doesn't stand for bed and breakfast. It stands for bed and booze. Um, you know that's that, that's sort of the sense of humor that uh, that they have there, and uh, and as well you know I. It's funny to say, but I bet every child in the South Okanagan knows Silver Sage as well, which is, you know, it's a weird comment to make about a winery, um, but they do the best decorations. Any time that there are uh, is an opportunity for, for decorations, like their Christmas light display, is uh, it's, it's, it's world class. People come from towns away to come and visit at uh, at the holidays so that they can see the way that this beautiful winery that's right down by the creek um, has kind of lit itself up and so it is a really incredible place it's a pretty magical pretty special location and uh, and they make wine that uh, that is so fun is so buoyant and so lively and that uh, and that even though it tracks towards sweet tends to always have something that is going to appease everybody, uh, even non-wine drinkers. I have, I have poured that blueberry wine and the flame for people that uh, um, unfortunately are friends of mine and have absolutely zero interest in wine. Um, I don't know why I keep such friends, but at least I have found something that they like, and it's the wines of, of Silver Sage. So, cheers to that. Ooh, that's gone. Mm. All right. Tracking back over to the east side of the valley, let's go over to the Golden Mile and let's go visit the Geringer brothers. So the Geringer brothers, uh, the actual brothers themselves, are Gordon and Walter. And Gordon and Walter, they have been making wine for many, many decades here. They, uh, they started their career by going over to Germany, both of them, and studying winemaking and, and, and viticulture, learning about the whole process, doing all of their, their professional training in, uh, in Germany. Um, but, uh, but they also had the whole family involved. They had their father and their uncle doing this, uh, this, this as they describe it, a comprehensive microclimate evaluation to determine exactly the right plot of land within the Okanagan to settle on. And after seven years, seven years of, uh, of, of trying to find the exact parcel, they finally settled on the current location of Geringer Brothers, which, as I said, is at the very top of Road 8. It's just on the, uh, on the north-hand side. And they have this beautiful plateau that stretches out uh, and, and kind of overlooks the valley below. And so they maintain this nice high elevation um, without, you know, kind of sloping down into the areas where cool air would pool more commonly. And so they have some, some excellent ripening potential in this location. They've experimented with a couple different types of grapes. They've done things like they planted Pinot Gris, they ripped up the Pinot Gris, they tried something else, they put the Pinot Gris back in. And, uh, and, and so they've been doing this longer than most other wineries uh, have even been dreaming. But the idea of being in business... Uh, 1985 was their first vintage. So, uh, so 35 years says it right there. 35 years uh, of uh, of production is uh, is a, a really formidable feat, and uh, and as well there is there's a benefit to the consumer, not just in the uh, in in sort of the the rich history. And the, uh, the, the the sort of the ingrained quality of Geringer Brothers wines, and it's that. Gordon and Walter, they, they got in early enough in the business that, uh, that they were able to purchase their land, they were able to construct their building, and they were able to set up their operation at a time when the overhead costs of producing wine were so much lower. And this, I, I, I've had cited to me from some people within the organization, this being one of the reasons why Geringer Brothers can get away with selling their wine for such insanely low prices they are they are absolutely the the uh, they're the ones to beat in terms of pricing in the Okanagan when you compare the ratio of quality of wine to the cost of the wine it, it, they're 
it's astronomical the way that they are able to do this. But like I said, they, they, they own their land. They had this building in place. They have their own bottling line on site, which they have to, you know, grumble away with fixing up and tuning and, and, and repairing every time that they need to bottle something. But they have everything. And that means that they're not leasing land. They're not uh, hiring mobile bottling units to come in and work for them. They're just doing it all on site. And that means that Geringer Brothers Estate Winery is able to sell a brilliant wine like this Oxerwa that I am holding right here. And I'm going to come back to that word in a second, but they are able to sell this wine for $14, which is bananas. I, I, I failed to say before, the, uh, the Silver Sage Sparkling, uh, $22, which is, I would say, also an extremely low price for a good quality sparkling wine like that. But, um, but you just can't compete with $14. It's wild. Now... Back to the name. This wine is Old Vines Oxerwa. As so many vines are on the Geringer property, they are old. And, uh, and so these Old Vines Oxerwa right here, this is, a, this is not a grape that people tend to come across very often. There's a little bit of it that's grown out here on Vancouver Island. Uh, and uh, and um, uh, Grey Monk. Uh, is uh, is one of the more well-known operations that deals in Oxerwa out in the Okanagan. But, uh, but the Geringers here have been doing it um, long enough that I have a colleague that works at Geringer Brothers who is currently investigating, she's researching who had the first vineyard. There's, there's enough debate that she's able to look into it Pardon me, to try to find out, did the Geringers actually have the first Oxerwa vineyard? Unfortunately, I was not able to get her for comment this evening before I came on here, so I don't know the results of her study, but, uh, but the point is, they've been doing it a long time. And this is, a, uh, this is a grape that it's fun to be able to try because, because it is a little bit of a rarity. It is an Alsatian grape. Do we all know where the Alsace region is? It is in northeast France. It is the region of France that borders on Germany. I was teaching a social studies class a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about the Treaty of Versailles at the end of World War I, where the Alsace region of France was ceded back to the French from the Germans. The Germans had occupied and taken over the Alsace region. It, it, it's a historic region of land that keeps on passing back and forth. And the Treaty of Versailles, they made sure that they secured that land back for France. So this is currently uh, a, a French area that this grape originates from. They, they do suspect that this grape came from actually deeper in France, but it is uh, grown in Germany quite a bit as well. By the way, when I tried to explain to the uh, grade 11 students why it was significant that Alsace was passing back and forth because of the quality of grapes that are grown there and the unique grape varietals like Oxerwa that were grown, that was a swing and a miss. Complete failure on that front. So, Oxerwa. It's this Alsatian grape, border of France and Germany. It is a, uh, it's actually a, an, an immediate sibling of Chardonnay. Uh, I, we've talked in previous uh, video tastings about the, uh, the mutability of grapes. They mutate at the drop of a pin, and you will cross two grapes together to get an offshoot, a, 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 a third grape, and, uh, and that grape can be so wildly distinct uh, that you wouldn't even recognize its parents, but it can also have siblings. So two grapes were crossed together to create Chardonnay, but while crossing them together to create Chardonnay, they also created Oxerwa. And if you taste this wine, you would not mistake it for Chardonnay. It is, uh, it is quite different, and yet they are immediate siblings. They have had the exact same parents, the exact same lineage here. But Oxawa tends to be a little bit more mellow in a lot of ways. Mm. It's very gentle. It has very... Hmm. It has very balanced um, acidity and sweetness. This is, this is what I want to sort of pull back into the... Um, the uh, the numbers, right, that I talked about at the beginning, the residual sugar, the total acidity, because this, this wine right here has a residual sugar of 11 grams per liter. 
So that technically qualifies it as being off dry. So this this is, you know, dry is what we use to describe, you know, wines with, uh, say, less than six or seven grams of sugar, uh, low sugar wines. And then bone dry would be a term that we use to describe the extreme bottom. You know, it's got zero grams of sugar or, or less than one gram. Um, and then off dry is that sort of sweeter style that goes from, you know, your, your six or seven grams up to your sort of 12 or 13 or 15 grams. And so this right here at 11 grams, you would think that you would get sweetness from this. But in fact, it tastes really clean and really crisp and it tastes dry. And so you look at the acidity on it. In the acid, the total acidity is 5.2. Now the, the general measurement scale for acid, most Okanagan wines tend to fall between sort of four and maybe eight, okay? And so if this is a 5.2, that's not extremely high acid now, is it? You know, a common Riesling would have an acidity of seven or eight. And if you come out here to Vancouver Island, your Riesling is going to be hitting nine, 10, 11. And so having a 5.2 for acidity is low. So you think, okay, it's, it's kind of, it's a little higher on the sugar and it's low acid. So why does it taste so clean and dry? The pH on this is 2.96, and I know that that number means absolutely nothing to you right now. So I actually should have done it a different way. What I should have said is the average range of pH is 3.0 to 3.9. Almost all pH levels are going to fit between that. Sometimes you bump up to a 4. So 3.9 is considered extremely high pH. High pH that completely negates the taste of the acid. You can have all the acid in the world, and that 3.9 pH is going to tamp it down so you don't taste it. I, a a 3.0, however, is very low pH, which means that all the acid in the wine is going to shine through. You're, you're getting unfiltered, right? Your sunglasses just have, just have clear lenses in them. There's nothing going on there to shade that wine. This is less than 3.0. It's 2.96. So the pH is just, it's, it, it's, it's a bug net with holes this big right? And so all the acid is shining through. And so 5.2 acid is not extremely high, but when you have a low pH, it means that it shines. And so this wine does not taste sweet. The interesting thing, and one of the reasons why I put these two wines against each other is that I always get a lot of pineapple. I get pineapple and pear when I taste this wine. And so it's interesting to shade it against a wine that actually has literal pineapple in it. And, uh, and it sort of, in some ways, it enhances it, right? The, the order that you do your wines in, they're always going to play against each other. And so I, I deliberately put the Oxerwa right after the uh, the Silver Sage because I, I, I like to see that that sort of tartness uh, pop a little bit. It's a, it's a little bit orangey as well. There's a little bit of, uh, yeah, there's a little bit of orange. A little bit floral on the nose, a little bit sort of white flower. It's so refreshing. I don't want to stop drinking it. <laughs> mm. It reminds me a little bit of a rainier cherry as well. That's the other, uh, the yellow cherries. That tend to be uh, just just a little bit more tart than uh, than than your your dark cherries, right? They, the flavor is a little bit lighter, a little bit cleaner. And um, and this is absolutely a fresh, clean, really crisp wine. And I think that people would be absolutely astonished if they knew that this wine had 11 grams of sugar in it. And, and just, I have, to, I have to defend it here, as I always have to defend any wine whenever I suggest that there's a higher level of sugar. Because just in the same way that people tend to react against acid and say, oh, acid, acid is bad. People tend to say, oh, high sugar, high sugar is bad. And I need to say that when I'm talking about high sugar, I'm talking about relative sugar here, which is my RS. Uh, relative sugar, because wine has so little sugar in it. Even the sweetest wines have pretty low amounts of sugar in them. I, I, I used to have some, some numbers called out for how many grams of sugar per liter you would find in a gin and tonic, or you would find in a Starbucks latte, or you would find in a rum and coke. 
And, you know, you're hitting 100 grams of sugar, you're hitting 125, you're hitting 150 grams of sugar with these other drinks that people casually take. Um, but, uh, But these wines, you know, the sweetest among them is no more than 11 grams of sugar in a liter. In a liter! Uh, a sugar cube is is four grams, I think. So this is less than three sugar cubes in a full bottle of this plus, you know, another third or quarter of another bottle, right? This is 750 mils. So my point is that when I talk about high sugar levels, I mean it in a relative scale. And in fact, the sugar is, is really quite low. Mm. Uh, kings of platinum. That's, a, that's, that, that's what... They say about Geringer Brothers, the king of platinum because of the incredible amount of awards that they have won over their many years. Even just within 2021 so far, just this year, they've already won six gold medals and best in class. Uh, their, their wines are constantly bringing home uh, medal after medal after medal. And they have 22 of them, not medals, wines. They have 22 wines. That's a lot of wine. It's an incredible amount of wine. They do more white than red. Um, and so, yeah, you know, again, you can kind of see some of their, uh, their origins as German-trained winemakers, right? German wine tends to lean towards white wines. And wines like this that have this balance of, of, of acid and sweetness. And, uh, and Geringer Brothers are, are absolute experts at this. And like I said before, they, uh, they've, they've, they've really been around since before any of us had any business uh, dealing in wine anyways. So, hmm. if you happen to be at Silver Sage, out on Road 9, drive across the highway, come on over to Road 8, and go visit Geringer Brothers. Uh, and while you're there, you head across the road when you're done, and you visit Hester Creek, which is the next wine that I have on my docket right here. Oh, I just uh, I just forgot something. I just forgot something that I wanted to talk about. Because it's hot. I'm going to say because it's hot, I'm forgetting things. Uh, but also because it's hot, people don't necessarily want to do the same types of food pairings that they would often do, right? I can tell you that, uh, that you know, here's a wine that's delicious with rack of lamb. Here's a wine that's delicious with, uh, with ratatouille. Here's a wine that's delicious with, uh, with uh, you know, chicken cassoulet, but nobody wants to turn their oven on. So what do you want to do when it's hot? You just want to snack, right? You don't have a big appetite. And so you want to eat chips, chips specifically. And so let me tell you exactly what chip is going to go with each one of these wines. The Silver Sage Sparkling Velvet because it has a little bit of that sweetness in there, but because it also has a little bit of this crisp zestiness, and because of that bubble, because of that wonderful, beautiful bubble, this is a good wine to clean your palate. The bubble has this natural scouring effect where it gets in there and it kind of scrapes your tongue clean. And so that's good when you have something a little bit dusty, a little bit gummy, namely when you have nacho cheese on your tongue. And so my recommendation, for hot weather, silver sage, sparkling velvet, and Doritos. This is exactly the sort of wine you want to have when you're t- when you are uh, mowing down on a bunch of uh, nacho chips, on a bunch of nacho cheese dusted uh, corn chips. And I mean, you know, go all out. You can buy Doritos, or you can buy some of the some of the fancy artisanal made uh, tortilla chips. Uh, with slightly less artificial cheese, but uh, but either way, sparkling velvet, perfect combo for that. Then you go to the Geringer Brothers Oxerwa, because it's a little bit more mellow, uh, because it's a little bit uh, a little bit more subtle. You don't want to hit it with too intense of a flavor, and so plain potato chips, because that brings in salt, which is a, which is a a welcome contribution to the natural balance that this has between acid and sweetness. You bring in a little bit of salt. That is going to round out that whole plate, right? A lot of times food and wine pairing can be related to balance, right? You try to balance out your meal so that you have a little bit of everything to kind of hold in relation to each other. And so for the Oxerwa, just bring in nice, clean, plain potato chips. Salted, definitely don't go unsalted. 
Why would you even do that? But uh, but nice salty potato chips with the Oxerwa. Mwah. Beautiful. Excellent combo. Now then, let us move on. And I'll tell you about the chips for this when I'm done. Over to Hester Creek. Hester Creek. Named after a creek that is named Hester. That's on a mountain. It's all mountains. Mountains and valleys in the Okanagan. Lots of creeks. Creeks everywhere. And Hester Creek. Hester Creek. This is... Another one of these wines uh, that bears a little label that tells you a date. And uh, whereas the Garner brother says 35 years, this one says 1968. Which, some of you may note, is even longer than 35 years ago. But, uh, but it wasn't always Hester Creek. In fact, there's, a, there's an unusual tie between this wine and Vancouver Island, where I am right now. By the way, did you know that the first British Columbia winery was on Vancouver Island? A lot of people think it was Kelowna wines up in Kelowna, uh, but uh, but Kelowna is only the longest continually operating uh, uh, winery. In fact, the very first winery in British Columbia was Growers, and by Growers I mean Growers Cider. Growers Cider Company started in Victoria, out here on Vancouver Island, and they were making Loganberry wine back at the turn of the century, early 1900s. And, uh, and then eventually in the 70s, they stopped their wine program and focused just on their cider. And so Canada's best known, you know, mass produced cider brand, Growers, um, in fact, was also the first BC winery. So Vancouver Island's got some cred. And, uh, and um, I, I've gotten completely off topic here, but, uh, but Vancouver Island also has a relationship with Hester Creek because the 1968 on this wine, <laughs> fingers, the 1968 on this wine uh, is referring to when the vineyard was planted uh, at their current location by a fellow named Joe Busnardo. And, uh, and Joe uh, did not call his winery um, Hester Creek. In fact, he called it Divino. It was established in the early 80s, uh, the winery itself, and then he wound up uh, selling it in 1996. It bounced uh, to a different owner and then came on to the current owners of Hester Creek in 2004. But it was in 1996 that, uh, that Joe moved. He took Divino, the brand, and he moved it over to the island. So now you can actually go to Divino Winery, but it's in Cobble Hill, uh, up, by, uh, up by Duncan on the island. And, uh, and yet it was where Hester Creek used to be. And so Hester Creek as a brand began in 1996. Um, with sort of some, some shaky years uh, trying to kind of figure out what it was doing and, uh, and some, uh, some conflicts over management until 2000, uh, uh, 2004 when the current owner, Kurt Garland, took over and completely flipped the winery around into something that is internationally acclaimed. So, uh, so from, from this sort of shaky patch right in the middle, Hester Creek has arisen as one of the preeminent wineries in the Okanagan, partially because of the original vines that were planted <laughs> by Joe Busnardo back under the name Divino uh, back in 1968, and then ushered into its current status by general good management and good winemaking uh, ever since 2004. So, Hester Creek. This is another wine that has a name that not everybody would necessarily recognize right off the bat, Trebbiano. Uh, like Oxerwa, this is a uh, this is another um, vinifera grape that we don't see very much of. But in this case, instead of being from the border of France and Germany, this one here is from Italy. Uh, Trebbiano is a is a lovely little Italian grape that needs a little bit of work, a little bit of coaxing to try to express full flavor from. But the team at Hester Creek does a wonderful job of making this one of their iconic wines. And Hester Creek has some very iconic wines. They have one of the best Syrah that, uh, that exists in the valley, I would say. It's a, it's a Syrah with Viognier that they're always perpetually sold out of because it's so good and they just don't make enough of it. And they also make Pinot Blanc. And, uh, and their Pinot Blanc is delicious. Uh, they make a pure Pinot Blanc uh, and, and 
Not enough people are doing that. I think Pinot Blanc is another very underrated uh, grape within BC that not enough people are touching. So kudos to Hester Creek for playing with that. And uh, they've just brought out a new sparkling wine. Uh, well, I guess it's the, maybe their second vintage of it now, uh, called Tiamo. And it's a Prosecco-style sparkling. So again, sort of bright and lively and fun, kind of similar to the, uh, to, to the Silver Sage right here. And uh, absolute, you know... Um, absolute uh, crowd pleaser um so they make a lot of excellent wines and they have put a lot of energy and a lot of effort into their winemaking program within the last 15 years uh to really make it world class so this wine right here it's got a little bit of a honey honeysuckle uh a tone on the nose mm. not cloying not uh, not overly sickly sweet, but you're definitely getting the uh, the the sort of floral spice of honey. Mm. That's lovely. Once again, you get a balance of sweetness and acid. The, uh, the, the sugar on this wine is much lower. This, is a, uh, this has a residual sugar of five points, okay? So five grams of sugar per liter, as opposed to the Geringer Brothers, which was uh, 11 grams of sugar. Uh, but, the, uh, but the acid on this is way up at 7.8, as opposed to the Geringer Brothers 5.2. So the acid is certainly a lot more present, and the pH levels are higher. It's 3.2, but remember what I said, 3.0 to 3.9, that's your range for pH. And so the Geringer brother is at 2.96, is incredibly low, whereas this here at 3.2, you know, it's, it's, it's moving up to, a, it's kind of a 25% pH, you know, you can call it that, right? It's, it's moving its way up the scale. But, um, but it means that there isn't a huge amount of defense against the... Uh, against the acid uh and so certainly more defense against the acid than uh, than than you would see in the Geringer brothers but um uh, but it means that you're still getting this lively uh, sort of beam of crisp acidity that's very stone fruit sort of um a little bit apricot, but a little bit you know, not 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 a super ripe apricot. No, that's that's, that's not right. Maybe more peach, more peach. Again, when I talk about broad categories, stone fruit is one of those categories, and stone fruit encompasses things like nectarines and apricots and peaches. Um, sometimes it can even include cherries by some definitions. But um, this is this is giving me a, a peachiness. I'm getting peach on this. I'm definitely getting some peach. Peach, a little bit more of that uh, that that spiced uh, honey aromatic is coming in on the uh, on on the tongue. After, that's lovely. That's beautiful. That is an excellent wine. It is uh, it is um, unfortunately out of stock from the winery itself. So if you want to get your hands on a bottle of the Trebbiano, um, if you live in the uh, the Lower Mainland, uh, Swirl. The, uh, the the VQA store uh, swirl, um, and uh, and I believe uh, Marquis Wine Cellar are two excellent liquor stores in the Lower Mainland that both happen to have uh, stock of this wine. Otherwise, you just gotta wait for next time. Hester Creek is definitely one of those wineries where you want to be on their list. You want to be in their wine club. You want to be on their newsletter so that you find out when these wines are available so that you can get your hands on them before they sell out which they do <laughs> all the time. They are another, uh, you know, incredibly desirable location to, uh, to, to visit all of the, uh, all the places that I've, uh, that I've mentioned so far are fantastic and well worth a visit. Hester Creek has this beautiful patio where you get this amazing view of the valley. You can buy, you know, a little charcuterie uh, uh, plate or that is to say, the, uh, the, the you know the, the little bits and bobs that you can put together and have a little lunch. You can you can get some wine, and go sit outside, and you can look out on the valley, and it's, it's a wonderful way to spend an afternoon. They tend to have live music in most years. You know, again, I'm saying most years, 
and I, and I'm and I'm generalizing because of course 2020 and the beginning of 2021 have been very different than uh, than we would normally uh, see. So you have to kind of assume that hopefully within within the next half a year, even just by next year, you should be able to see uh, a turnaround and 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 go and enjoy these wineries in the way that they are meant to be enjoyed. And also, as, uh, as somebody's just pointed out, as Lisa's pointed out in the comments, the villas at Hester Creek are excellent. In the, uh, in the Okanagan, you, you actually cannot build um, accommodation on agricultural land. So if you have uh, an area, a vineyard that's zoned to be agriculture, um, then you cannot just build accommodation there, which means that new wineries that are coming in are unable to create hotels, or, or whatnot. Silver Sage gets around it by having a B and B, which you are which you are legally allowed to have, but you can't create a hotel. And uh, and yet Hester Creek, they sneak in there because it already existed before these bylaws got passed. So the Hester Creek villas are one of the few places where you can actually stay right there, at a winery, at a vineyard. You have access to uh, to um, Terrafina restaurant, which is world-class uh, food right there at your disposal. You've got the winery right there and uh, and the villas are beautiful. They're fantastic. But uh, but if you want to book a villa, pfft, start right now and, uh, and, and aim for next year. Although I know they probably had a lot of cancellations. Um, um, so uh, so who knows? Maybe you can go and you can sneak in at this uh, at this moment. Tell, uh, tell, tell Melissa from the villas that, um, you know, you'll give her a bottle of Cab Franc. And there you go. That'll 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 get you in the door. So Hester Creek, absolutely worth visiting at any opportunity that uh, that you have. And uh, and the wines, while sometimes elusive, uh, when you can scrounge them up, my goodness, are they ever worth it? And we have just one winery left to visit here today, uh, which is good because it's already eight o'clock. Uh, and that is a winery from or a wine from a winery that now goes by a new name. The winery that used to be called Oliver Twist was started several decades ago by a different owner than it currently has. The current owner, Gina Harfman, has been operating Oliver Twist for 15 years now. And uh, crumbs. I think I got that uh, that that number wrong. Well, you know what? I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna tell you something straight up before I before I say anything more about this. Nostalgia wines are very good. I like them very much. I like the people that work there very much. In fact, I just recorded an interview with the manager of Nostalgia Wines, Sheila, and that interview is going to be released next week, uh, Tuesday of next week. There will be uh, an episode of my podcast, Uncork the Sun, with the Institute Wine School, that will be coming out, which will have about a 25-minute long talk between Sheila and myself about Oliver Twist turning into nostalgia, about the owner, Gina Harfman, and about the various wines that they make. And it's a really good interview. Sheila is very, very charming. Um, she's really, really easy to listen to, so I really recommend that you check out that episode of the podcast especially because having just done that interview and having been editing this episode for the last couple of days, I didn't write down any notes about Oliver Twist. My piece of paper that usually has notes about all the wineries for me to remind, I just didn't write any down. I thought, oh yeah, no, I, I, I know nostalgia wines. I know Oliver Twist nostalgia. I know all about it. And now I'm actually trying to say it and I'm realizing, oh, I forget how long Gina's actually owned the winery for. You're going to have to listen to the episode to find that out. But I will say this, the winery was started as Oliver Twist, and then Gina Harfman comes in, she buys the winery, and she runs it as Oliver Twist. However, the connection between Gina and the name Oliver Twist, as was described to me by Sheila, has become more and more tangential. And Gina has always wanted to have her own winery with her own brand and her own name. And so finally, they decided to celebrate the 15th anniversary of Oliver Twist by embracing a new name. And so it is a winery that exemplifies the idea of nostalgia. The name fits perfectly. You go there they've got the old cars out in the front lot they've got the old music playing on the uh, on the stereo 
it is a it's like it's like a, a beautiful, comfy 1950s diner or drive through experience embodied in a modern winery. It's, uh, it's a little bit hard to describe, but when you go there, the name fits perfectly. Plus, Gina, uh, I did not realize this, but Gina, the winemaker, um, incredibly talented winemaker and viticulturalist and farm kid. Her family has been farming grapes and involved in everything in Oliver and Asoyus um, for, uh, for, for decades and decades, for generations here. Um, she also uh, used to be a, um, a, a, an artist. She used to do uh, pinstriping and, uh, and paint jobs for hot rods. <laughs> and so... Uh, she has herself owned a number of hot rods, and this uh, this bottle right here is not one of the pinup collection that uh, that um, Oliver Twist had been getting quite well known for, and now uh, and now Nostalgia Wines uh, will be known for. They have these fantastic uh, pinups, uh, these these pinup girls with these cars, and the cars a lot of them uh, relate back to cars that Gina has owned in her life. So again, another little note of nostalgia right there. I'm ruining everything that we talk about in the podcast, but it's fun, it's exciting, and I I'm also kind of glad that we don't have one of the pinup uh, bottles right here because you know those have been around for a few years. A lot of people have seen them. But this right here, this is the new label for Nostalgia Wines. Uh, and in fact, it's so new that they had to bottle this wine without a label because they hadn't settled on the label yet. And they were at their bottling date. And so they had to get the wine in there totally blank. And then they had to hand label every bottle once they had finally settled on the label. But what they wanted to go for, as Sheila describes it perfectly, Nostalgia. Nostalgia is not a objective concept. Everybody has their own idea of memory and nostalgia and their own particular um, their own particular um, things that bring them back to better times. And so what they wanted to do with this bottle is create a label that did not necessarily prescribe a certain type of nostalgia. I've said that they have a little bit of that 1950s jukebox feel, but they didn't want to do something as obvious as putting, you know, here's 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 a jukebox and a slice of apple pie on there because that would be isolating for the people that are of a younger generation that didn't necessarily have that as part of their personal nostalgia. And so instead they went for this abstract design that I really love. I think it's incredibly classy. And uh, and they they sort of ask people to look at it and say what it looks like to them, what it reminds them of. And what they say is that uh, people say all kinds of different things. Some people say it looks like the uh, the, the grainy static on a television that has uh, gone off the air. Some people say, oh, thank you, Ginny. I did not tell you about the chips for Hester Creek. I'll get back to that in just a moment. Some people <laughs> some people say that this reminds them of uh, fields of wheat. Um, but uh, but a lot of people will say that this reminds them of uh, of sunlight on the water. To me, it looks very much like sunlight on the water, and uh, and so you know it's a little bit of an ink blot test where you 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 take your own memories, you take your own thoughts, and you prescribe it on that, just in the same way that uh, that nostalgia uh, is separate and unique to everybody. So very uh, cleverly done label, and uh, and I am extremely happy that they have gone with this rebranding taking the term Oliver Twist, um, which didn't really have meaning or significance to Gina, and bringing out uh, something that is much more personal to her. So, I like how uh, Jen Nelson goes ahead and, and, and replies with ripples on the lake, um, which also sounds like she's trying to answer Ginny's question of what chips go with Hester Creek. The answer is ripples on the lake. No. Ah. Um, Hester Creek... For the Trebbiano, you're going to want to go sour cream and onion. This is your sour cream and onion wine. Because the sour cream and onion brings in uh, a, a little tiny bit of heat, right? That onion flavor. That onion flavor has sort of this natural spiciness to it. And the sour cream brings in this little element of richness. That's not necessarily going to pair with just any wine. And so this one right here that has a little bit of this... Uh, this, this um, almost false sweetness. It, it has a little bit of the impression of the sweetness without actually necessarily carrying it through with that bright, crisp, clean acidity. Perfect, perfect, with something a little tiny bit richer. So your sour cream and onion potato chips, you can go ripples if you wanna, if you wanna go with Jen Nelson's idea. You can eat them on a lake. I know that's not actually what she was saying. Um, so have your sour cream and onion chips with your Trebbiano. 
you'll be a very happy person. It'll cut through that, uh, that little kind of hint of spice in that richness. Perfect pairing. Now, on to the nostalgia. You may notice that the uh, that nostalgia bottle is a little bit lower in volume than the others. Uh, they do give you 750 milliliters, but my wife stole a glass of this before I was able to get the bottles out here. So, so it started a little bit low. Okay. So, a little more coloration, right? You can see that, uh, that, that slight more uh, kind of golden tone to it. Beautiful nose. Really, really potent. The balancing of the wines, when you put them into your lineup, you know, if you have bubbles, you tend to want to start with your bubbles, and then, and then you work from sort of your mellower, kind of softer wines to your more intense wines. If it's red wines, you start from low tan, you go to high tannin. If you're trying dessert wines or whatnot, you go from least sweet to sweetest. Here, I've put the kerner at the end because it is a little higher in terms of sweetness. The, the, the sweetness pops a little bit more, but also it is so intense. It is this explosive burst of fruit character. And so you put it as the little kind of bookend there at the, uh, at the tail of the, uh, the tasting. Beautiful, wonderful. You know, what's interesting is that it almost smells a little bit like um, a little bit like lychee fruit, which tends to be the thing that Gewürztraminer is always associated with, which was, you know, the sparkling velvet there, which I don't particularly get uh, lychee fruit from the sparkling velvet. I get a little bit of it right here. Melon, you know, you get, you get some wonderful, rich, a little, uh, little bit honeydew. A little bit orangey as well, sort of your uh, your your sweet, um, not mandarin, a little, bit, a little bit mandarin, sweet sweet orange, sweet soft, low acid, mm. at least perception on the nose. Now, let us taste. Mm. It's great. It's wonderful. This is uh, this this is such a such a such a beautiful wine. It's so balanced. It's so inviting. So comforting. Mm. Again, it has has a bit of residual sweetness to it. It's a it's almost nine grams of uh, of um, of sugar per liter, as opposed to the uh, the Auxerrois eleven grams. And the Trebbiano's five grams, right? So, so you've got a little bit of sweetness there. <sighs> the acid is uh, is pretty close to the uh, to the Oxerwa. That was five point two. This is five point one, and the pH, however, is the highest of the bunch. It's three point three five, and uh, and and again, I'll remind you, the uh, the Geringer brothers was two point nine six. The uh, the Hester Creek was 3.2, and this is 3.35. And, uh, and and again, if you're not intimately familiar with this, you would think the difference between 3.2 and 3.35 has to be minute, right? But it's not. It's actually it is it is a pretty extreme difference. Every 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 fraction that it goes up, every digit that it goes up, kind of increases the level of defense against acid. And so you have the highest pH of the bunch and you have the lowest acidity of the bunch. It is a, it's just a tick below the Geringer brothers. And so that means that the acid is very well contained in this. You get freshness. It would not be in this lineup if it didn't have a fresh, clean character to it. But it means that the sweetness in there, that nine grams of sweetness, even though it's lower than the uh, than the Oxerwa, it pops a bit more. You get more of this juicy, rich sweetness. Consider, if you will, how sweetness can bring out flavors. Think about tea. Something that always drove me nuts when I was a, a, a teenager, when I drank lots and lots of different types of tea, is uh, I would buy vanilla tea and I would think, this sounds good. It says vanilla right on the box. I like vanilla. Let's taste this. Um, look at me. Of course I like vanilla. 
And, uh, and so I would try this vanilla tea and it doesn't taste like anything at all. But I don't put milk or sugar in my, uh, in my tea. And then finally one day, um, somebody told me, you got to put sugar with it. And I put just a teaspoon of sugar in this tea and boom, there's the vanilla. The sugar elevates it, it brings it out. And so again, we're not talking high enough amounts of sugar for it to be, you know, particularly caloric. You're not, you're not getting, um, you know, these, uh, these unhealthy amounts of sugar, but you are getting enough sugar in there that it makes the flavors of the, the, the fruit, of the floral tones, the pear, the honeysuckle, the, uh, the, the um, honeydew melon. It is making all of those flavors pop and jump out. And so this, this wine is juicy, it is fresh, it is a little sweet without coming across overly sweet, and, uh, and ultimately it's just, it's, it's just insanely easy to drink. And, uh, and so this unique balance of being a little bit sweeter, a little bit sweeter, a little more muted on the acid, means that here, finally, we can put this with ketchup chips. You don't want to put ketchup chips with most things because the tanginess of the ketchup is going to sharply react against acidity levels that are too high. And so what you actually want to do is you want to have a little bit of sweetness because that's going to catch the natural sweetness in the ketchup and bring that forward. And that's going to mellow and soften the intensity of ketchup chips. I think a lot of people don't like ketchup chips if they also don't happen to like things like salt and vinegar chips, right? They come across a little bit tart. They come across a little bit too, uh, too, too intense, too extreme. But the Nostalgia Kerner, the 2020 Kerner, I never even told you what the grape was. I'm sorry. It was hot today. Um, the uh, 2020 Kerner from Nostalgia, fantastic pairing to go with ketchup chips. So there you have it. Sparkling Velvet from Silver Sage to go with your Doritos. Oxerwah from Geringer Brothers to go with your plain salted potato chips. Hester Creek Trebbiano to go with your sour cream and onion. And then finally, a little bit of Kerner from uh, Nostalgia to go together with your ketchup chips. Uh, by the way, pricing, the Trebbiano $23 and the Kerner $22. Every one of these wines is under $25. In fact, if you add up all four of them, it's $81. And then if you balance that out, it means that each wine would come to $20.25, which is an absolute steal for these four wines, all of which are of an immaculate quality and perfect on a sweltering day when you just need something to help bring your body temperature down. Mm. And you also want it to taste very good. All right. Thank you, everybody, for, uh, for tuning in today. Oh, that wine's so good. All these wines are so good. I'm going to have some more sparkling velvet in a second here. I have been Monster Kogel. Tune in a month from now as we will dig into... Uh, some, uh, some, some fun variations on wines that come from the Rhone Valley in France. We've got some Syrah. We've got some, uh, got some very, uh, some very, um, um, interesting things to talk about and, and quite frankly, some of the best grapes to grow in the Okanagan. And as well, like I said, next week, one week from now, uh, download our podcast, um, Uncork the Sun with the Vinstitute Wine School because we are going to be talking to Sheila Whitaker from Nostalgia Wines. We're going to be talking about nostalgia. We're going to be talking about Sheila's career. Um, it's, it's kind of fun because we usually talk to winemakers, and it's nice to talk to somebody who is on the, well, on the business side, somebody who is actually managing the operation instead of just making uh, the product. But as well, I, I play a fun game with Sheila where we try to name a grape variety for every letter of the alphabet, and that is very entertaining, I would say. So... Tune in next week to Uncork the Sun with the Institute Wine School for that, and come back a month from now to watch our next live stream tasting. I, I looked at the video from last time, and one month ago, I was wearing a button-up shirt. I was wearing a long-sleeve button-up shirt to this tasting, and I was not sweating. So, uh, so, look at that. How wild. Cheers, everybody.
have a uh, have a very good uh, summer vacation for all of you who had uh, kids in school. 